Welcome back to Oakhaven. Several times we've taken uh, woodland walks and we've seen ferns out in the woods out here. And I've said, oh, we should really should do a video just on ferns so we can explain some of the life cycle and some of the interesting things about ferns as a whole. They're really a fascinating group. Uh, so this is our opportunity to talk about them, uh, ferns in general. So the major difference between ferns and most of the plants that we talk about when we do our woodland walks and uh, do other things on the, on, the, uh, on the property is that most of the plants that we talk about are angiosperms or flowering plants. Ferns do not produce flowers or seeds. That's their major difference. Some people like to say that ferns, instead of producing seeds, produce spores, which is true, they produce spores, but I wouldn't say that spores are actually analogous to a seed. A seed and a flowering plant is the joining together of a male and a female plant, and they have combined their genetics together into a seed and formed a new creation there with new genetic combinations uh, that then goes off and spreads and becomes a new plant. Spores that are produced on a fern are exact duplicates uh, genetically of the, the plant that it comes from. It's not, a, it's not a question of mixing up its genetics. So we're going to take advantage of this fern garden that uh, I just planted for Father's Day just a few days ago. So the ferns look kind of beat up. I apologize for that, but it gives us a, a variety of ferns all in one place. Uh, so as we talk about the definitions of ferns and what makes up uh, a fern and how, what, what, to, uh, what to call the various parts, the main part of a fern is called the frond. Okay, the frond includes the stem or stipe and the blade, which is where the leafy part of it is. So the stipe and the blade make up the whole frond. The blade can be either divided up like this or less divided. Here I'm going to reach over and get... I'm actually going to break this off because it's kind of broken from, from transplanting it. This is a narrow-leafed spleenwort. This and Christmas fern are good examples of something that is once divided. So you have just the center, what's called the rachis, that the rachis is the main stem that the blades are attached to, or that the, um, the, the pinnae um, are attached to. So this is a, these are pinnae, and it's once divided. There's only one that comes off. Now you can see this would be twice divided because each pinnae is divided into separate pinnules. So you can see how that's twice divided. Now, if the pinnule is also divided, that's thrice divided, and you would call each of those other, um, you would call those lobes coming off of the, the pinnules. So you have pinnae, which is divided into pinnules, which could be divided into lobes. This is almost divided into lobes. You can see that there's, this, you could almost say this is thrice divided because there, there are lobes there. This is spinulous wood fern here that we're looking at. So that's some of the things to think about as far as definitions when we're talking about um, different ferns. On the rachis, you can see this rachis has scales. Sometimes the rachis is just smooth. So that's another thing to look for. And the other thing you want to look for is, is how it's, it's connected together. So this is a clump forming. So there's a rhizome underneath here, a hefty piece of like root-like material that's under the ground that the, the fronds come up from. So the difference between ferns and angiosperms, or flowering plants, is that the ferns produce spores. So the spores are generally produced on the underside of the leaves in tiny dots or on a separate fertile stalk that will come up here. And I don't have any right here. Um, uh, grape fern and um, rattlesnake fern, cinnamon fern, uh, there's other ferns that will have, it, it doesn't look at all like this leafy stalk, it looks like a completely separate stalk that comes up, it's brown and it has a bunch of, of uh, uh, spore producing bodies on it. So those spore producing bodies are called sori. So you will find, and let's find some that we, where I can show you. So how the sori are um, distributed on the on the frond or on the pinnule or the pinna or wherever they are um, is very diagnostic of what kind of fern it is. So this is a Christmas fern 
Christmas fern, you can recognize it has, so it's once divided, and these pinnae have this little lobe on it that makes it look kind of like a Christmas stocking. Okay, we've talked about that before in videos. So this is Christmas fern. But Christmas fern, you'll notice that at the base of it, it's really scaly. And then the fertile part is up at the top, where you'll have these non-fertile, these sterile leaves, and then these pinnae are covered with sora. Inside that are sporangia that are producing spores. Those spores will get spread out, and you know I say that, that spore, spores are not like the seed-producing part of a, an angiosperm. Spores are similar to seeds in that that's the, the part of the life cycle that gets spread out and will spread the, the young babies away from the, um, the parents, which is kind of what plants like to do. They want to spread their offspring out so that they're not all one, in one location. So spores are very light. It's, they're produced by thousands and thousands and thousands, and it can be uh, blown around in wind currents, if you get the right wind currents, you can have um, fern spores that are spread around the world. So that's what spores do. So the other thing that makes ferns different from the other uh, groups of, of plants that we have dealt with so far is that ferns produce two very different, unique life forms in their life cycle. There's the sporophyte phase, which is what we think of as the fern. It's got the frond and it's... Uh, leafy and green and produces the spores. That's the sporophyte phase. Those spores go out and produce the gametophyte phase. The gametophyte phase is an amazing thing for ferns because I bet most of you have never seen a fern gametophyte. They're about the size of a fingernail. They're like small little um, group of cells, just like a, a thin tissue of, of cells that grow on the, on the ground. Um, so we'll talk more about that. We'll talk about the whole life cycle. So to understand what the difference is between the sporophyte and the gametophyte, I need to talk about genetics a little bit. So bear with me for a little bit. I will try to get through this, and hopefully it will be understandable, and you'll think, oh, that wasn't so bad. So uh, genetics. All of our cells, all living things, have chromosomes, have genes that are held within strands of, called chromosomes that determine the, the building blocks or ter determine the, um, um, the blueprint for how the, the plant or animal is structured. We have genes, we have 23 genes that are in pairs, so there's actually 46 total genes inside every cell of our body um, held in a pair. So 23 pairs, making a total of 46 um, chromosomes. Now, when a, a baby is born, that's the mother and the father's um, cells coming together and the, the genetics there, they're, it's combining their genetics. Now you can't have the number of chromosomes combining and doubling every generation. That would just get astronomical. So living things go through a pretty cool process called meiosis, where you take all of those cells that have pairs of genes. How can I do this on my fingers here? Okay, there's our pairs of genes. <laughs> and each pair of genes separates out and one pair goes to one cell or one half of each pair goes to one cell and the other half goes to another cell. Those are called gametes. In people, we think of those as being the sperm and the egg. They don't have the full set of chromosomes. In our case, they just have 23 chromosomes, not the full 46, because they only have one out of each pair of chromosomes in the sperm cell and the egg cell. Ferns, it's the same thing. There's sperm and there's eggs and each of them only have one of each pair of chromosomes. We call that haploid. Haploid, or 1N. You see that in diagrams all the time. You'll see it in this diagram I'm going to show you. That means that the, the genetics have been split into two cells so that when it recombines through sexual reproduction, it has one complete set of chromosomes, but we haven't doubled our chromosomes. So when it comes back together again, that's called diploid diploid or 2N, meaning that there's two of each set of chromosomes. Okay, so we've said that the fern with the leafy structure here is the sporophyte generation. 
So the sporophyte generation creates the spores, okay? You've got sora, which are, is made up of all these sporangia. The sporangia open up and dump spores. These spores germinate on the soil when conditions are right and has to have the right moisture and other things on the soil. It germinates and grows a prothallus. That's this green here, it's called the prothallus. And it grows up and it's kind of generally heart-shaped. There's um, rhizoids that are at the base of it and then it grows up in kind of a heart shape with a notch here at the top. Remember, this is small. This is about the size of like my fingernail, my little fingernail here. So the rhizoids go down into the ground and pr provide nourishment for this, in this case, a, a green prothallus. It gets more confusing. This, all these plants that we've talked about here produce green prothalli, prothalli um, that actually photosynthesize and produce energy. Some, I see over here, there's a, a, a rattlesnake fern, and we have grape fern, and there's um, adder's tongue fern that are in a different family. The prothalli for that never turn green. They actually live under the soil. They don't germinate, and they don't grow past this stage until they've been infiltrated by a fungus. Then it develops a mycorrhizal association with it, and the fungus actually provides the energy for this prothallus that lives under the soil, and it can live there for several years until it gets to the next stage where it, it um, goes through and goes through the sexual reproduction we were talking about. Remember, this is uh, 1N or, or haploid. So on the bottom of this prothallus, whether it's green on top of the soil or not green underneath the soil, it produces archegonia. Archegonia are these vase-shaped um, series of cells with an egg down in the bottom of it. That's the female structure. So down up here towards this apical, this apical notch here, the um, egg is produced. And there's maybe, you know, there's several dozen of these who will grow on each prothallus. On the bottom, down by the rhizoids, there are, are um, antheridia. Antheridia produce sperm. The, these sperm actually have little flagella and swim around. It has a little spiral-shaped flagella. As it, uh, as it ripens, and when conditions are right, meaning that there's enough moisture, it will open up and release these sperm, which will swim around and look for ripe eggs in the um, archegonia. Now, because it's always best to, to mix up the genetics, it, you don't want it to be... Um, pollinating itself, okay? You, want it, you don't want it to self-pollinate. Ideally, you would like the, the pollen to go, or to uh, the, the sperm to be finding an egg other than on its own prothalli. So the antheridia generally will ripen first and release its sperm. Those sperm will swim off through a, a film of water on the, the, surf, uh, the surface of the uh, prothalli or on the ground and will find someplace else to fertilize, hopefully another prothalli that has ripe um, eggs in their archegonia. So that goes through, uh, if, if, just to say, if there aren't other prothalli, it can fertilize itself and produce an, uh, an egg. So the sperm come over here and swim into the archegonia and fertilize the egg, which is, produces a zygote. That's got, okay, remember these are both um, monoploid or haploid, haploid, one set of uh, each chromosome. It comes in here, it joins together, and now we're diploid here in the zygote. So now we've restored and we're back to this, the normal number of chromosomes. That egg then will germinate and will grow, here's our prothallus again, will grow into a new sporophyte generation. So here's a new fern that's growing up. And it will, as it's first growing, it will use the energy that's in that prothallus, um, and then it will also send out um, rhizoids and roots that will start producing or start pulling nourishment for the, the sporophyte or the fern frond um, for it by itself. And then we get back to the beginning of the cycle again, where we have the the whole frond as its sporophyte generation producing spores and going back around through the whole process. So pretty complicated process when you consider that we, we normally only think of ferns about this stage here in the middle. It's doing some pretty cool things 
through the rest of these stages. Now, I should mention something that's kind of unique about ferns. As ferns are producing these um, spores, it's going through meiosis, ferns are <laughs> kind of crummy at doing a neat meiosis, okay? Ideally, in meiosis, you would take that pair of chromosomes and it would split up and you would have half as many chromosomes in each of those gametes. Ferns tend to leave extra genetic material all over the place, so you end up with more genetic material in each gamete than the half that you should. So when you get over to this stage where it fertilizes and produces the zygote, you don't have half and half that's joining together to be diploid again. You've got extra genetic material. So if, you, if it hasn't separated, you may, it may have three times instead of diploid, meaning two times, maybe there's three pairs or more. It could be polyploid. And ferns have a tendency to do that. And that, that's one way you get um, new varieties and new species of ferns by this genetic mess up, if I can call it that. Ferns have been around for a long, long time. They've had lots of time to mess up and create new ferns. So if this is now a tetraploid situation because the last generation, the gametes were not quite half and half, then that gets passed on, and then the spores are also tetraploid, or when they're broken down, there's extra genetic material, and it goes through. It can pick up, pick up extra genetic material every time it goes around. You can imagine that that would cause a lot of genetic diversity. For taxonomists, it provides a real headache because you find uh, plants that are pretty similar they're just a little bit off because they've got that extra little genetic material in there. It's kind of like hybrids. I want to talk a little bit about this book. This is a fern finder. You can see it's a little dog-eared. I've had it since college, so it, it, I've had it for a long time. Great little book. Um, I recommended this series for the winter tree identifications. I, I also recommend it for this fern finder guide. I'll put a link to it in the description if you're interested in, in buying it. It's like five and a half dollars. Um, obviously, if you buy it through one of our affiliate links, we get a little bit kicked back to us. Not very much on a five and a half dollar book. Um, but it lays out the ferns pretty nicely. Um, the only problem with this is the same problem we have with any text, is that um, it, it, as soon as they print it, it's out of date. Right now, we're going through a, an incredible time with genetic mapping, and so there's a lot of things that are being split up. They're realizing that they're, uh, when they look at the genetics of it, that it's this area, this thing we were talking about, where they're it's, uh, diploid or tetraploid or, or polyploid and whatever, and that they're, they're dividing things up differently than what they may have done uh, back when this was, was printed. Um, so they're changing the names. It's always a good idea to go online. You're more likely to get more up-to-date information about what, uh, what names of plants really are. But this gives you a, a thing to start with, and it gives you something you can, you can find, okay, well, it matches this description. Then you can go onto that description and say, oh, well, now I see it's been divided up into a number of different things. Um, this is um, a lowland brittle fern, a lowland brittle fern, you know, 40 years ago was called fragile fern, and fragile ferns have been divided up into various uh, ferns. But the, the one that we have growing with us is lowland brittle fern, um, but you won't necessarily find that in books. You need to find that more online. Anyway, there is an introduction to ferns. Hopefully that was useful to you. Hopefully it wasn't just too much garbage that it was too hard to understand. I apologize if I was uh, uh, not making it clear. but. Uh, the plan is that uh, we are then, then going to go out and do another video on the ferns specific to our property. We have 10 different ferns on our property. Uh, we'll talk about each one of them, tell you a little bit of the uh, interesting parts of their life history and how to identify them, how to tell them apart from other ferns that are, uh, look like them. So that'll be the next video. You've all, you're well prepared now for any conversation that goes on in that video. So. Uh, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you know of somebody that uh, might be uh, might find this useful, you know, please share this video. We always appreciate comments. Uh, we'll try to get back to you. Uh, so, thanks for listening.